It was Blaise Pascal, I think, who first said, I have written you a, a long letter because I did not have time to write you a short letter. Uh, Mark Twain borrowed that as well a couple of centuries later, I think. Um, a concept like that obviously will be uh, familiar to uh, lawyers um, who don't have much time and who consequently write long letters. I'm not a lawyer, uh, and I wouldn't have the temerity in this august company uh, to express uh, too many opinions about the uh, European Commission's uh, agenda for change in the copyright regime over the next uh, number of years. Uh, I do have strong opinions about the proposals from portability through to the much anticipated new draft directive which we're expecting in July. I'd be very happy to talk to, to them about you afterwards or in questions. But what I'd like to do instead is to present um, a simple, indeed simplistic, uh, thesis uh, about the role of uh, creators, about our baseline thinking uh, about copyright, uh, which informs the way in which we then approach uh, copyright reform uh, in the European Union and elsewhere. So, uh, my name is David Kavanagh. I have two jobs, uh, which proves how brilliant I am or proves how bad I am, I'm not sure which. Uh, I work for the Writers Guild of Ireland, uh, which has 380 members uh, in Ireland, writers who write for film, television, theatre, radio and games. Uh, and I also work for the Federation of Screenwriters in Europe, which brings together 18 European guilds uh, from around Europe uh, with our office in Brussels, from where we spend an inordinate amount of time in the corridors of the Parliament trying to be friendly with uh, MEPs' assistance and in the horrible rooms that the Commission occupies all over Brussels uh, and depressing uh, meetings um, with them. Um, we, um, as part of that, uh, not being strong organisations ourselves, we cooperate very much with, with organisations and work together in groupings. Uh, one of those groupings is a grouping which includes uh, collective management organisations. Uh, they have some money, uh, and one of them uh, commissioned a report from uh, Ernst & Young. I have to get used to calling Ernst & Young EY. It sticks in the tongue somehow. I can't say it so easily. Um, they have uh, measured the size of the culture and creative uh, industries in Europe for the first time in 2012. It's a very interesting study. Uh, they looked at uh, these sectors, visual arts, advertising, TV, newspapers and magazines, books, architecture, performing arts, music, film, gaming and radio. And they discovered that the value of the culture and creative industries in Europe is 550, more or less, billion euros. That's to say, more than 4% of the gross domestic product of the European Union. The employment by the culture and creative industries in Europe is more than 7 million persons, 3% more of the uh, employed population of the European Union. Uh, they also put in these ones which I found fascinating, which is that during the years from 2000 to 2007, uh, when European Union growth was at about 1%, the creative and cultural industries were growing at 3.5%. And during the period of the recession, when growth was falling in Europe, the creative and cultural industries were still growing. Uh, not much, but still growing. Um, of course, those are numbers. What did they mean in, in the context of, of employment in general? The creative and cultural industries in Europe are the third largest employers in Europe. They employ six times more people than the telecommunications <coughs> company do. This is a, a massive part of the, our, of the economy of the European Union. And I think it's very much recognised now in the European Union and the national governments just how big and how important this sector is, even if it's not well organised or doesn't present itself coherently. Um, obviously, when I looked at this, I thought immediately, OK, how does that relate to the size of uh, the culture and creative industries and employment in Ireland? Uh, the population of Ireland, as you all know, is 0.9% of the population of the European Union. And roughly speaking, then, I suppose that you would expect that we would be turning over 50 billion euros and employing about 70,000 people. There aren't any good studies. Uh, there's one study done by the vanished... That's because I pushed the wrong button. Yes, done by the Arts Council. It was an assessment of the economic impact of the arts in 2012. And this assessment is the same year as the assessment done by the, the um, uh, EY study. And it comes to, you'll see, 4.6 billion, uh, but eccentrically it includes software in it. It seems that the size of the culture and creative industries in Ireland is significantly less than you'd expect them to be on a proportional basis. And the same is true when you look at employment. Uh, the baseline for employment that this study produced is 48,000 Irish people employed. 
uh, but it uses a multiplier effect of 1.6, which I think is, let's say, dodgy. Uh, and it also includes in software employees in the first place. Uh, the number is probably something like 30,000 euros. These are very rough figures. In other words, the industry is huge in Europe, and it's smaller in Ireland than it should or could be. How do individual creators relate to that? Um, it's quite difficult to find any statistics at all about the uh, remuneration of authors in the European Union. Uh, the Commission has commissioned two studies, uh, one of which was published last year, one of which is just in the process of being published. The one last year was extremely disappointing. It dealt with audiovisual and music and was more or less incomprehensible. I think the Commission itself recognises that. And they've struggled to improve that in the second study, which will come out shortly, uh, which will deal with uh, visual arts and literature. Um, but from I've read some sections of it myself. I know that people who read sections of it, they don't have a great deal of confidence in what it's going to produce. What, I've done it again. What I can tell you with some certainty is about the income of screenwriters, because they're the people I work with. Um, in 2012, we did a, a, an online study of, of European screenwriters. Uh, 700 persons replied to this. That's about 11% of, of the, the database that we appealed to. So it's statistically credible. Uh, and that demonstrated an income per annum after tax in 2012 of 22,000 euros. Uh, that's to say a median income, not an average income. Um, I want to draw your attention to the figure at the bottom, um, which you might be interested in, Victor. Uh, which is that collective management organisations are responsible for about 10% of the income of uh, many, um, uh, about 60% of those screenwriters. Um, I can tell you from my own figures that in Ireland, the average annual income of a screenwriter in 2009, which is the last time that we counted it accurately, was €14,245, and the uh, median income was about 10,000 euros um, uh, for a full year's work after tax. Of course, at that level of income, you don't pay tax. Um, artists in Ireland don't pay income tax anyway, um, so the, the tax issue doesn't uh, come close. Um, and that's reflected when you look inside our study of the various countries, although I, don't, I can't rely too much on these figures. The numbers are very small when you break it into countries. Uh, that shows you uh, Ireland uh, in 2012, earning a little bit less than Poland and a little bit more than Greece and, and Bulgaria. I think in 2012, to say that you earned more than a Greek, it didn't really amount to much of a boast. Um, there is a study done by the Arts Council of the Living and Working Conditions of Artists, and it shows in 2007 and 2008 um, average income of about €15,000 and median income of about €8,000. That's the uh, second time in 25 years that the Arts Council has done that study. The last time they did that study was 25 years ago. And when they did it 25 years ago, artists were earning more than they were earning 25 years later. Um, I'm going to go back there a second. Um, artists in Ireland, as artists everywhere, earn their income from two sources. Uh, the first is their initial contract with the person who commissions them to do the work or who purchased the work from the first place. And the second is the income that they earn from the economic life of what it is they've created, uh, usually coming to them from a collective management organisation. Um, contracts are extremely important, and uh, they relate to copyright in this sense. They are the legal instrument by which a producer or a publisher purchases the copyright in the copyright system. It's not so simple in the author's rights system purchase the copyright from the original author. I want to show you some terms from a, an actual, real Irish contract signed by, to my knowledge, at least three writers, and I've seen about 14 uh, versions of this floating around them. I'm pleased to say that with the other 11, I advised the writers not to sign them, and they agreed. Um, but let me just give you an indication of what it is that Irish writers routinely are asked to sign by way of contract. Now, being lawyers, you have all read this instantly and understand it without hesitation. But for those in the audience who aren't uh, writers, I've taken out the key phrases. Uh, and this contract asks the writer to assign the entire copyright throughout the universe in perpetuity. Or what we say to writers who ask for an explanation, everything, everywhere, forever. They're also asked to sign this paragraph. And again, I've reduced it. Uh, which basically says to the writer, you are required to write as many drafts of this contract as we ask you to do uh, with a completely limited number or limited time scale of what should be involved. We also ask them, how, they also say how much they will pay 
uh, for this work, and that's the payment. And just in case you misunderstood the one you're in writing, it's then in brackets afterwards to make it clear that your payment for selling your entire copyright throughout the world forever is one euro, having done as much work as the producer asks you to do. Uh, please notice the sentence at the end, on the first day of principal photography of the film, in other words, only if the film actually goes into production. If the film doesn't go into production, they're not going to pay it one euro. And most projects do not go into production. And finally, this one, uh, which is my favourite, which says that if the author receives money in respect of rental and or lending, it should be rights in there, but they didn't put it in for some reason, rental or lending rights, uh, which are usually in the contract, satellite transmission or cable retransmission of the work and or the film, the author should inform the producer who can then demand that the author pay any such sums that they receive over to the producer. Um, it's little wonder in the context of contracts like this uh, that authors earn the kind of money that, that, they, that, uh, that they earn. Um, the simplistic story narrative that I'm trying to say to you is, is so obvious that it seems like a waste of your 15 minutes to say it. But my experience consistently is that this story, when we tell it in uh, the Parliament or the Commission, is readily understood and easily accepted. Um, we met recently with President Schultz, um, whose daughter has just graduated from theatre school and who himself used to be a book uh, seller. Uh, and he understood this story uh, faster than we were able to explain it to him. He uh, was very sympathetic and wanted to help. We uh, brought, we were invited by, how am I doing? Yeah. Time is over. Mm -hmm. Time is over. Oh, it's over, okay. We were invited by Pavel Swoboda, the head of the jury committee, yeah. to uh, meet with the consumers. Uh, and again, they understood the story well. It's not understood in Ireland. Um, I would like to conclude with tentative answers to two questions, and I'll make them very quick. Uh, the first one is, if the creative industries in Europe are so financially successful, why are artists who create the copyright so poor and with such unstable incomes? And it's impossible to avoid the conclusion that the reason is that those companies which purchase the work from the producers in the first place know that they can get away with low payments uh, and exploit um, uh, the artists whose work they then go on uh, to use in what is one of the largest industries in, in the European Union. We need um, European Union level protection and individual state level protection in order to protect ourselves from this kind of crude exploitation. And why is it that the situation, my second question, which brings me nearly to the end, my second question, why is this situation so much worse in Ireland? Well, we suffer, first of all, as you can see from that contract, from uh, this um, determination on the part of the people who purchased the rights in the first place to exploit us but we also suffer from a profound failure of public policy in Ireland. Public policy in Ireland for many, many years, in every instance that you see the application of a European Union directive in Ireland, has over and over and over again refused to compensate the artist, or where they have done, they've compensated the artist at the absolute minimum possible level. And this is the, the fundamental experience of individual creators faced with copyright reform. A change in copyright law which does not have as a key factor in it an intention to enrich the artist, and I use the word advisedly, an intention to provide fair remuneration. Fair remuneration to me is proportionate remuneration, proportionate to the income generated by the work. If you're not guaranteed fair remuneration, you're being exploited, and that's wrong, and we will oppose as a matter of course in policy any copyright reform which does not have as a key intention and ambition the enrichment of the author. Sorry for going over. Thank you very much. For your